Assalamu alaikum. In the last six months, we have covered so many different topics related to an Naba'ul Azim, the prevalent news or the prevalent premonition that the Quran provided us all throughout in almost every surah of the Quran. In this segment, inshallah, we will dive a little bit more specifically about a surah that talks about the promise, the great promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, which as we said in the last segment, the first part of Surah Yaseen, this promise is at the, this promise represents the pivot point for the whole an Naba'ul Azim. We start inshallah, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, bismillahir rahman rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, rabbi shrah li sadri, wa yassir li amri, as you see, we're talking about Surah Al-Mursalat, Surah number 77. And as we said last time when we were discussing part one of Surah Yaseen, we said at the core of that Surah is the promise that is included in the Quran. The Mujrimun ask in Surah Yaseen, وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in this Surah and in three or four other Surahs, clear descriptions of this promise. We're going to take advantage of this point to describe the promise, the promise Al-Wa'd by Allah, to describe the full details about Surah Al-Mursalat and present the unraveling of the Hur. Surah Al-Mursalat includes a lot of difficult terminology and concepts that cannot be understood unless you really understand the big promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prevalent premonition or Al-Naba'ul Azim that the Quran talks about. Unfortunately, most of the books of Tafsir ended up referring back to the biblical definition of the Day of Judgment, so to speak. A big cosmic day in which everything is destroyed and in which everybody is resurrected and we are all presented in front of Allah to be judged according to our deeds in the past life and so on and so forth. But until then, nothing happens. Well, that's a wrong model as we have explained so far. We have explained clearly that the model of the afterlife in the Quran is dramatically different than the model for the afterlife in the Bible. So those scholars who went to the Bible to understand the afterlife model and brought it to impose it on the Quran really did not serve the community well. And they presented a model of the afterlife that is totally not aligned with what the Quran talks about. So when we understand the afterlife model according to the Quran, according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us, using the vocabulary, the Abrahamic locution in the Quran, then we can understand this promise and we can understand many things that will happen in our own lives, in our own time, perhaps phase three as we're talking about it right now. So this is the context, this is the concept that we're presenting and you will see it fits beautifully in Surah Al-Mursalat. As a matter of fact, it fits everywhere in the Quran. This is why it's called the prevalent news. It's so prevalent, it's almost everywhere in the Quran. So we start with ayah number one. وَالْمُرْسَلَاتِ عُرْفًا And we notice immediately عُرْفًا which is the crest, which is the singular for the crest. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us there's an oath by the ones sent with recognizing the crest or sent with the crest. They speak the crest. They, they speak these they speak these codified terminology, the Abrahamic locution as we've defined it. And the muttaqun receive them. These are the disciplined believers. فَالْعَاصِفَاتِ asfan, And then the same ones, the angels, who are sent with such crest or with such terminology, they raise the storms that disperse the heretofore erroneous interpretations into useless chaff. The erroneous interpretations become nothing or disappear in the face of the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is including in these crests in the Abrahamic locution that we talked about. وَالنَّاشِرَاتِ نَشْرًا So the word nashara or nushur in the Quran refers to the concept of bringing the clouds or bringing the, the sahab, the ideas that allow us to gather some hints or some clues about the topics. And therefore we develop the hypotheses and therefore we develop the concepts and try to verify them and to prove and truly understand what the Quran is saying. This is the concept of nushur, nashran, nashirat, refer to the same thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath again by the ones spreading persistently the correct understanding of scripture 
through the process of nushur or nashran from the Quran and its message from Al-Kitab. فَالْفَارِقَاتِ farqan. We're still talking about the angels. Here we have an oath by the angels and here we have another oath by the same angels who do other things. In this case, al-fariqati farqan, they establish a clear rift, a clear separation. Remember this word, separation, fasl, because we're going to see this, yawmul fasl, in this surah. And this is the promise. The promise is about yawmul fasl, the day or the time of separating the good from the erroneous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about al-farq, which is to clearly separate, distinguish, create a rift between the erroneous versus the divinely sanctioned evidence-based understandings. Both different understandings, the erroneous ones versus the divinely sanctioned, and the ones who accept such understandings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating a clear farq, a clear fasl. And remember when we studied the concept of the splitting of the moon as it occurred in one hadith, and as is mentioned in one of the surahs that we discussed in the last six months, we saw the hadith in one of the hadith, the companion who reported that hadith, he talked about firqa, a separation, a group that comes apart. So that happened with the first sa'a as we described it. Here, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the angels who come also for the second sa'a. They create another rift, another separation. فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرًا And then delivering evidence-based knowledge based on dhikr. Based on dhikr, of course. This is what we've been saying. Dhikr is the heart, the essence of the whole Qur'an because it's the repository of all the vocabulary, all of the Abrahamic locution with which we understand the rest of the Qur'an. So all the Qur'anic stories and parables upon the muhtadun and the mujrimun. So they deliver or they cast the pronouncements from the dhikr upon the muhtadun to tell them about the good news that's awaiting them and upon the mujrimun, those butchers of interpretation who abuse the interpretation and the terminology of the Quran and warns them about all the punishment or all the severe separation that's coming. We talk about all of these things. These are all coherent, well-integrated concepts that fit through all the Quran. So now, alhamdulillah, the Quran illuminates and we see all of these concepts are coherent with each other. They collaborate to give us a complete picture. No weird concepts, nothing unexplained. Everything becomes very, very well fitting into this premonition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us. Now, ayah 6 says, فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرًا عُذْرًا أَوْ نُذْرًا Exculpating those who accept the evidence-based understanding, meaning providing them the excuse, providing them the justification, providing them the explanation that fits according to their yusr. Remember yusr? Yusr is the ease of cognition, the ease of accepting according to your own cognition. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the angels who create this rift and who bring the reminders and the dhikr based on the Quranic stories and parables, provide these reminders with a uzr, exculpation or excuses or justification or warning, warning to those, as we said, the other group of people who accept the erroneous and not divinely sanctioned terminology from the Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the conclusion of this first page, إِنَّمَا تُوَعَدُونَ لَوَاقِعَ And this is where we understand the promise. Indeed, what you are promised shall occur. Shall occur. لَوَاقِعَ It shall happen. فَإِذَا النُّجُومُ طُمِسَتْ Now we start understanding specific events or specific details that take place at the time of this promise. So now we have to keep track of about 10 different paragraphs, 10 specific signs that are given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actually more than 10 in these 10 paragraphs, and we will see one by one. فَإِذَا النُّجُومُ طُمِسَتْ And that shall be, meaning this promise, what you have promised up here, that shall be when the original teachings of stars, i.e. messengers and prophets, and we've seen this before, become extinguished, no longer available to the masses. And indeed, if you look at the tradition today, 
the books of tradition that are available to the masses. We don't have the original teachings of the original messengers and the original prophets. What we have are the teachings of people who wrote the so-called Bible, including scholars who took from the Bible, who took by the dozens stories and information and reference models, including the reference model for the afterlife. They took all of this stuff from the Bible. They did not take them from the Quran. These are not Quranic scholars per se. They were teaching us the Bible all along under the guise of teaching us the Quran. Did they know it? Allahu alam. Allah knows. Did they do it on purpose? Allah also knows. So we read what we read in here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us one of the signs that will happen at that time, at the time of this promise, which we believe we are in right now. This time right now, phase three, as we've said it before, is the time when we are learning that the original teachings of the stars have to be recovered from the Quran because otherwise they have been lost. وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فُرِجَتْ And when after that, the abstract understanding exposes access openings, openings to allow us to get into the depth and the semantics of the text, the scripture. وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ نُسِفَتْ The verb نُسِفَ that means to pull something up by the root, by the root of that plant or the root of that shrub, so to speak. That's the verb نَسَفَ So we reflect about الجبال, the compositional units, of the text of the scripture and we understand that the way to understand them is to dive deep into the roots of these words and really to expose the meanings by the roots of these words. This is methodology. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us to go back to the roots of the words of the vocabulary in order to understand al-jibal, the compositional units. وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ And when the messengers are discovered to have been timed in their roles, past and future. What is this talking about? Well, first the verb uqqitat is from waqt, waqt which means time. So in Arabic, the waw, when we are using it in the past tense, sometimes is replaced with the hamza uqqitat. So instead of saying uqqitat, the Quran says uqqitat, which is perfectly legitimate Arabic. Wa idha rusul, the messengers, the messengers, are timed. What does that mean? That means their mission, their roles had a specific time limit and their time was completed during their original mission and their teachings were gone as we saw a little earlier and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing us to relearn, to relearn the new role they may have at this time of the promise. At the time of the promise they may have a new role. As what? as Mursaleen, as we said last time. They are sent again as part of the legions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send to reteach Al-Muhtadun, to reteach the people who attach themselves exclusively to the text and the scripture of the Quran. So as you see, the concepts and the meanings and the semantics are very coherent, very connected to each other. The same concept again and again, but now in a totally different surah using new terminology. So now by understanding the main concept of the promise and phase three and the concept of reclaiming the original teachings of the messengers through the text of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us additional confirmation. And by having all of this multitude of confirmations from different surahs all pointing in the same direction, we get this confidence that we're on the right track, alhamdulillah. وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ And when the messengers are discovered to have been timed in their roles, past and future, they will have a future role. لِأَيِّ يَوْمٍ أُجِّلَتْ Until what time were they, the above events and discoveries and the messengers, until what time were they delayed? Until لِيَوْمِ الْفَصْلِ To the time of separation or divarication or as we saw in here, the time of the clear rift. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using multiple terminology, pointing us to the same thing. Are these synonyms? No, they're not synonyms. There are slight differences in their meanings, but they're pointing to the same indication, the same event, the same time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring this understanding to make it available again. And this is the promise. The promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will rise a new group of people as we call them and refer to them according to the Quran as sa'a number two. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will separate between these people 
and the rest of mankind because these people attach themselves exclusively to the Quran, to the terminology of the Quran, to the authoritativeness of the Quran. I hope it's really clear. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلِ And he, your Qareen, did not acquaint you with the importance of the time of separation. This is addressing Muhammad now. Muhammad is being told, you're not aware of how important this time is going to be. Why is this referring to his Qareen? Because his Qareen was an important source of knowledge, at least an important source of misinformation in some cases. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam by giving him a qareen that gives him false information at times or hides information from him at times but the text in front of him the text that was available to our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam was unchanging was immutable was unforgettable and therefore our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam had an authentic resource to go back to again and again so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning him be careful allah is telling you your Qareen did not acquaint you with the importance of the time of separation, this Yawm al-Fasl. This Yawm al-Fasl is very important time. It is referred to in the Quran in at least half a dozen different places. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Woe at that time to the beliers. مُكَذِّبِينَ Beliers. Belying what? Belying the terminology. Belying this promise. Belying the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring back the ard the scripture back to life and let it expose its veritable loads and real information, useful semantics that have been hidden from us for 1400 years. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning those who belie the ability of Allah to speak to us again directly without intermediaries. And this is the biggest warning in this surah, al mukaththibin It's a warning to those who belie. We're going to see again a little later inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same surah will refer to the mujrimin, mujrimun, those who butcher the interpretation because they belied the proper vocabulary, the proper interpretation of the terminology of the Abrahamic locution. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a direct warning to those who belie. We're going to see the same warning repeat 10 times. 10 times. That's how important it is not to belie this promise that is clearly in front of us in this surah and others. Then the surah continues, Alam awaleen. Did we not eradicate or make extinct the earlier ones, the earlier generations who belied? Of course we did. And then we similarly caused the later ones, meaning in phase two, to follow them in their erroneous ways. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you think just because you are given the Quran and the Quran itself is preserved, you're not going to make the same mistakes as al-awwaleen, the earlier generations who were given the first scripture, the scripture for Musa. Of course, you can be making the same mistake just like them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we will make the latter ones follow the earlier ones. And this is exactly what we saw from the narration from our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we explained in the prior segments on this channel. كَذَلِكَ نَفْعَلُوا بِالْمُجْرِمِينَ This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned to do for the butchers of interpretation, separating the interpretation from the scripture. In other words, taking the concepts away from the scripture. So when they come to explain the story about Isa, they brought the story of Isa from the Bible. When they came to explain some of the stories from the Old Testament, they brought the explanations of the people of the Old Testament. When they came to explain, when our scholars came to explain the model for the afterlife for a Muslim, they went to the Bible and borrowed that model of hell and paradise and that cosmic day for judgment and all of these details and imposed, imposed by force upon the Quran their understanding from the Bible, not from the Quran as we have demonstrated in the last six months on this channel. So as you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to them as al-mujrimin. So what is Allah going to do to the mujrimin? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to do to the butchers of interpretation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do yuhlik, eradicate, make them extinct. What does that mean? That means the understanding and the explanations they brought will be proven to be wrong and they will be made extinct and we will see a little later in the surah, they will be brought back, they will be reunited with their followers in the Qareen process, in the model of the afterlife for a Muslim. And you will see that very clearly coming through in the next few ayat, inshallah. 
So we continue. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Woe at that time to the beliers. As I said, this expression is repeated ten times in this surah. أَلَمْ نَخْلُقْكُمْ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينَ Did we not create you from a lowly fluid? فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينَ And then we concealed it in an established concealed location, well-preserved location. إِلَى قَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ Until a due proportion, that is evidence-based. Based on some evidence, you have developed some evidence for knowing exactly when it will end, that period of gestation. فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ And then we proportioned the disclosure of knowledge according to a measure. And well deserving of our compliments are we a proportioning according to a measure. What is this paragraph talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, you think as Muslims, as followers of the Qur'an, you're not going to come through the bad periods and then regain, regain your knowledge and regain your mastery over the text and understanding of the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course you can. Remember how you yourself were created from a lowly fluid and you were placed for a limited proportion time in an established concealed location, concealed. That knowledge was concealed from us in phase two, in the last 1400 years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us by looking at ourselves, at our own creation, how we went through a very similar process. And this is giving us the good news, the glad tidings, that just like we were proportioned before coming out as a human being that is ready to develop again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna bring out this community of as sa'a from the womb of the concealment that we went through in the last 1400 years. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, well deserving of compliments we are at proportioning according to a measure. There's a measure that's calculated through what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. The same thing applies to us. And in here there's a very important hint for those of you who really toil very effectively. We continue, وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ كِفَاتًا Did we not include in the scripture the characteristics that it is homogenized and folded upon itself so that its inside is concealed and so that to it is access is restricted. So this is a mouthful for this one word. And it's really funny, as I was researching this word, kifatan, I found that it's directly related to kafta, the word kofta or kafta, which is referred to in some countries as kebab. You know, you, you take the minced meat, so to speak, and you fold it and you add to it some herbs and some spices and you add to it some salt and maybe some tomatoes and some vegetables and you fold it and you fold it and you fold it until it becomes homogenized and very well mixed and they put it on skewers, etc., etc. That's called kofta or kafta. That's exactly the same word. It's an Arabic word. So kifatan means exactly the same thing. It is homogenized and folded upon itself and its inside is concealed and access to it is restricted. What does that mean, access to the kofta is restricted? Well, you have to grill it from outside and the inside still remains a little bit undone, etc., etc. But the important thing is that it's homogenized and it contains many, many different concepts that come very well together and together it's folded upon itself so that its inside is concealed from the outside. This is the definition of kifatan. So what does the scripture have to do with this? This is exactly what the scripture is. It's like kofta. It's mixed and homogenized and folded upon itself again and again until it becomes uniform and coherent. So when you take some eats from it, some bites from it, you taste a very beautiful taste that is coherent together because of the way it's mixed together. This is similar to the compositional unit that we talked about before. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that the whole scripture is made that way. Made that way based on what? Based on ahya'an wa amwatan. It includes news and information and reports about both the dead and the living. The dead and the living. So it's not just stories about the past that it's also stories about us, the living, and future living ones. Yes, of course, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this ayat. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ كِفَاتًا Remember this interpretation and this explanation. This is kind of funny, but it's a beautiful representation of exactly what the scripture, the Quran, represents to us.
وجعلنا فيها رواسية شامخات وأسقيناكم ماء فراتا and we concealed in it in the scripture lofty anchoring principles and we provided you sweet water to quench your desire to understand them of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided the principles that we use all the time when doing the verification and validation of our interpretations from the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the water, the rain, al-ma'an furata, very sweet water that comes fresh to quench our desire to learn, to quench our desire to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. And I hope it's really clear as we're doing it right now. Wailun yawma idhin lil mukadhibin. Woe at that time to the beliers. Again, we're still talking about al-wa'd, the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about in this surah and in many other surahs. Now, this is a tough paragraph. Many books of tafsir did not deal with this paragraph very well, but inshallah you will see that we will deal with it based on the terminology of the Quran. We're not going to make it up. We're not going to invent our own things to stuff into the words of Allah. So, وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the beliers, woe to you at that time, at this time, at this time. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep reminding the beliers not to keep belying? because there will not be another opportunity to come back to the truth for a long time. This is a limited time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them, if you belie what's being presented, this terminology that we're talking about, the Abrahamic locution and these concepts and the connection to the authenticity of the Quran to be the authoritative source over itself, this reverence given to the words of Allah, this is something that is required of everyone. And if you belie these presentations and this understanding, there might not be another opportunity for you in the future. You will be permanently separated. Wail on to them, woe to them at that time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them some mocking advice. Please pay attention because the superficial layer is not necessarily what's intended. Just like the rest of the Quran, you have to dive into the concealed to really understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach us, al muhtadun insha'Allah, compared to Al-Mujrimun. Al-Mujrimun are going to read the superficial and they're going to misunderstand. So it is not the superficial that's intended. انطلقوا إلى ما كنتم به تكذبون Run or head for relief if you insist to what you used to be lie. So what did they use to be lie? The terminology, the vocabulary. Run there. Let's see if you understand what I'm going to give you in terms of instructions. So Allah is going to give them instructions except that these instructions are concealed below the superficial layers. They insist on the superficial layer. So let's see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell them to do. انطلقوا إلى ظل ذي ثلاث شعب Head to a shade or a way of supplication, I'll explain in just one second, that is characterized by three branches. So what is the shade that's characterized by three branches? If you go back to YT93, that segment that's three hour long, where we talked in full about the Abrahamic locution, about Millet Ibrahim, we explained clearly the concept of who was Shu'aib, the fact that Shu'aib was a descriptor for our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we gave all the details and we gave all of the evidence from the Quran, clearly explaining that Shu'aib himself was a descriptor, a name given to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the story of Shu'aib is partly the story of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Shu'aib was one of the messengers and the prophets that followed in the path of Ibrahim. And we said at that time, if Muhammad is a Shu'aib, a little, a little path, a little path, Ibrahim had two other, two other Shu'aib. He had Ishaq and he had Yaqub. And therefore that makes him a person with three Shu'aib, with three Shu'ab. This is exactly what this ayah is saying. So this Dhillin, the Thalathi Shu'ab, he is the father of the terminology that we use for making supplications. Dhil. This is the definition of the word dhil. So a shade, is a way of making supplication, the Abrahamic locution that is characterized by three branches. The first one was Ishaq, the second one was Yaqub, and the third one was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the beliers, of course they're not going to understand because they don't understand this terminology. They don't want to accept that the Quran is built on this terminology. 
So they are going to be lie. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them directly to their face. This is your solution. This is what you have to do if you want relief. Relief from what? From the woe that's being promised to them. انطلقوا إلى ظل ذي ثلاث شعب لا ظليل ولا يغني من اللهب For you, the beliers, this is neither shaded nor is it protective from the flames. For the rejecters, for the beliers, yes of course. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, I'm going to give you the instruction right here, it's in front of you. If you understand the terminology of the Quran, you understand this, you have to refer back to the Abrahamic locution. You have to refer back to Millat Ibrahim. This is what he's telling them. The Milla that came with three different branches to follow it, Ishaq and Yaqub and Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, here's the instruction. I'm being fair to you if you understand, if you stop belying. But in reality, it shall be neither shaded for you, meaning it's not going to hide you from the bright illumination, from the bright pronouncements, and from the bright warnings against you in the scripture. And it is not protective from the flames. It is not protective from an-nar, from the dimly lit man-made illumination. For whom? For the beliers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues challenging the beliers. You think you understand the Quran? You think you understand the superficial layers of the Quran? Let me give you two more. Innaha tarmi bi shararin kal qasr. It, and remember, innaha, ha in here, is a feminine pronoun referring to a third person, so to speak. Innaha. It could be a person or it could be a thing or a plural of things. So what is it referring to? We're going to see. Innaha. Termi, it is casting, shararin, sparks, kal qasr, characterized by brevity. The people who follow the superficial layer said, it is characterized by sparks like castle. What does that mean, sparks like castle? Of course, it does not mean anything because this is their limited understanding of the terminology. But when we understand the terminology correctly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about brief sparks, meaning sparks characterized by brevity, qasr. Qasr is to make something really brief or really concealed or confined. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the sparks that we talked about in the last several segments when we talked about what you see during the days. Those of you who are not aware of what I'm talking about, refer back to the prior segments and you'll understand what I'm talking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that there's something that casts sparks characterized by brevity. These sparks are so brief, so quick, so sudden, and so full of information. They're like sparks of energy that hit you. What is this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about? So we said, innaha is referring to a feminine word or feminine noun. If we go back up through the surah and climb up and we read ayah 25, we see that al-ard is the first female noun that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in reference to this pronoun, innaha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this scripture, al-ard, the scripture, casts sparks characterized by brevity. Meaning if you read, paying attention, really engaging the Quran, engaging al-jibal, the compositional units, you get these hints, you get these sparks. From whom? From alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, those who are with you and helping you read and understand and engage the Quran. Of course, because they're doing the saf to your Weltanschung. And we've talked about all of these concepts before. I'm just reminding you that all of these concepts come together to conform to the same overall understanding of what's going on. To make sure to let you know the Quran is very coherent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, as you engage the Quran, Al-Ard, the scripture, the text itself, you see sparks that are characterized by brevity. They come very quickly. They spark some ideas. They spark some hypotheses. And now you have to go and verify and do more study and check and evaluate whether or not these hypotheses really lead you to the correct understanding. The next ayah continues. These sparks, كَأَنَّهُ جِمَالَةٌ صُفْرٌ as if it were whistling fast in its comprehensiveness. So these sparks, which are brief and characterized by brevity, are all-encompassing and they're comprehensive in their understanding. 
As you notice, these are very short ayat, very short ayat throughout the whole surah, but yet they all point in the same direction. The concept is very clear, very understandable, if you have a good understanding of the afterlife model according to the Qur'an. If you insist on the afterlife model according to the Bible, and you think, as the books of Tafsir did, that this whole surah is talking about this cosmic day of judgment, then none of these words would make sense. So this is the challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving al-mukathibin, those who belie the Qur'an. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ They belie the vocabulary of the Qur'an, the terminology of the Qur'an. هَذَا يَوْمُ لَا يَنْطِقُونَ This is a day when they, the beliers, don't express anything. Are we witnessing this? Of course we are witnessing this. Just look at the comment stream and you'll see those who really belie what we're doing and what we're saying have nothing to say because they are out of arguments. They accused me of this, they labeled me of that, they made up stories about us, they did whatever they want, and eventually they ran out of accusations. There is nothing left for them. And the Quran is still yielding its treasures and yielding its beautiful concepts and meanings and semantics in coherent ways that leave everyone speechless. This is exactly what this ayah is saying. They are left speechless. Who? Al-Mukathibin, those who belie. وَلَا يُؤْذَنُ لَهُمْ فَيَعْتَذِرُونَ And they are not permitted to apologize at that time. This is what I said a little earlier. There will come a time where time is up. You cannot make a U-turn anymore. You cannot go back and make up for the belying and the lies that you have concocted against what we are presenting. We are presenting the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unraveling the hur by allowing us to understand what has been concealed from us for 1400 years. Join us, allow yourself to learn, allow yourself to really understand the depth and the meanings of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept and saved for us for 1400 years. Wailun yawma idhin Woe at that time to the beliers. Again, this is a refrain that's repeating, as I said, 10 times in this surah. هَذَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلِ جَمَعْنَاكُمْ وَالْأَوَّلِينَ This is the time of separation. Now pay attention because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling it separation, but in reality is joining because He is saying, جَمَعْنَاكُمْ وَالْأَوَّلِينَ We joined you, meaning the beliers, together with the earlier ones who intentionally initiated the erroneous interpretation. What does that mean? Remember we talked about the Qareen process. The Qareen process, a person who is alive and believes and follows blindly the earlier generations who misled us, Al-Mujrimun, who created the erroneous interpretation, perhaps on purpose, perhaps without knowing. Those leaders, those thought leaders, become the Qareen for the followers. Jama'anakum, we bring you together. This is exactly what the ayah is saying. It's very clear, you cannot misunderstand it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling it al-fasl. Why? Because those who suffer this Qareen process in their life, in this life, in here, being joined by Qareen from the past, those so-called predecessors, they follow blindly. Those become your Qareen and the legs become intertwined. Well, tafati saqu bis saq and then you don't have a way to get out of that trap. This is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ironically is referring to as yawmul fasl. It's the time of separation. As we saw earlier, فَالْفَارِقَاتِ farqa. They are segregating those into a form of hijr, into a form of quarantine. Who? The beliers. The beliers will suffer that fate. They will be left to their own devices. They will be segregated from any source of proper understanding. And this is the warning. The warning is there will come a time, maybe perhaps we are in it right now, where the beliers don't have a way out anymore. Even if they want to, they don't have a way out anymore. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah 39 is challenging them. فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدُونَ And thus if you are capable of plotting against me, Allah, against the Qur'an, go ahead and plot against me. We'll see how far you can get. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Woe at that time to the beliers. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shifts the tone of this ayah to start talking about al-muttaqeen, the disciplined ones, to give us the good news. 
إن المتقين في ظلال وعيون. In this time, phase three, the disciplined ones are enjoying shades of supplication. ظلال, as we saw a little earlier, ظل, supplication. إن المتقين في ظلال, shades of supplication, and well springs of divine guidance. وفواكه مما يشتهون. And they are toiling on witty speech of the type that they desire. كلوا واشربوا هنيئا بما كنتم تعملون. Eat, eat between single coat. As you remember, it means to sustain yourself spiritually, consuming the divine discourse, enjoying the company of the legions. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And drink and receive the direct guidance delightfully in accordance with what you used to toil on the scripture. This is the only thing that matters. Toiling on the scripture. Ta'malun. This is the toiling that we keep talking about. Inna kadalika najzi al Be among those who are seekers of insight. And thus, this is how we recompense the seekers of insight. Wailun yawma idhin lil mukadzibin. Kulu wa tamatta'u qalilan innakum mujrimun. Woe at that time to the beliers because those people, they're instructed to eat and enjoy the limited delay for they are butchers separating the interpretation of the scripture from the scripture. Who is this referring to? Perhaps to the earlier generations that we saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about. Wailun yawma idhin at that time, woe to the beliers. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ ارْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ This is the ayah that scares me. Because this ayah is telling them there will come a time where they are instructed to capitulate, to capitulate, to repent, to go back from the erroneous ways they followed, from the wrong interpretations they preached. And they refuse. They refuse. And this refusal is the proof that they're really not interested in the divine guidance. أعوذ بالله that we are among those people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never make us among those people described by this ayah. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ ارْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ If they are told to capitulate, they do not capitulate. They do not go back from the mistakes they have made. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Woe at that time to the beliers. فَبِأَيِّ حَدِيثٍ بَعْدَهُ يُؤْمِنُونَ In what discourse then, after it, meaning after the Qur'an, do they believe? And this is a direct hint at who the Mujrimun are. And this is a direct hint at who al mukathibun the Beliers, are. I hope this surah is very, very clear. I hope this surah gave us clear understanding of the confirmation of all of these meanings that we've covered so far and the concepts and the prevalent news and premonition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us in the last six months as we covered these topics in so many other places. We continue, inshallah, in the future segments back to Surah Yaseen and back to other surahs that confirm the same concept about the promise, the coming promise or the current promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to understand. And with this we close. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah laqad jaat rusulu rabbina bilhaq. Thank you so much for watching. Salamun alaykum.